Praise the Lord. Go ahead and turn your Bibles. Turn your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Just had it in my heart to deal with, uh, deal with the area of not yielding to fear in our lives. You know, fear is a, is a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. And certainly it's a condition of the last days where many, the Bible says, many, many's hearts will fail them because of fear. Fear is, a, is an enemy. Fear is something to be resisted, not yielded to. Amen? Amen. 2 Timothy 1 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Well, if God hadn't given it to us, we have no business with it. <laughs> Amen. And so, but He has given us, He says, a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Praise God. So, God's not given us this spirit of fear. And if you're going to be a victorious Christian, if you're going to be fruitful, uh, and if you're going to mature and develop spiritually as God wants you to, you can't be continually yielding to fear. Fear is something we've got to learn to uh, biblically deal with and not just cope with it, but actually learn to resist it and overcome it and keep it out of our lives because it will hinder God's will, God's purpose, God's plan, God's blessings. Amen fruitfulness in our lives and it'll, it'll affect our spiritual growth i want to just look uh, for we're going to look at a couple of areas some three areas really uh it's what we have time for there you, we could look at others but uh three areas where a christian should not be yielding to fear three areas or you could say three kinds of fear you need to be resisting however you want to look at this but uh, number one is the fear of dying the fear of dying. Look in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Now, you, you all do know if the Lord tarries, we're all going to physically die. I mean, that's, you do know that, don't you? <laughs> I mean, so, so it's a reality of life. But, uh, but for the Christian, uh, we need to realize God doesn't want us having any fear of death. And this is important, and uh, some don't realize how important it is. But um, here in Hebrews 2, verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus also himself, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. See, this kind of fear of death produces bondage. It produces bondage, the Word tells us. But thank God, through Christ, we've been delivered from that. But we still have to, we still have to walk this out. We've got to walk in the Word, don't we? So you've got, really, you've got to overcome this fear before you can even begin to live the way God wants you to. You have to be able to overcome this fear and uh, to be able to live the way God wants you to. You know, in so many people's minds, death, physical death, is just some unspeakable horror but that's not God's view you know we we again that's why we have to get our minds renewed <clears throat> to the word of God <clears throat> so we can get a heavenly perspective of things and we need to get in this area we need to get heaven's perspective of physical death you know we we of course teach around here that Jesus is a healer and we teach that it's God's will to heal. I mean, we, you can get last week's message. We talked about that. Uh, but we, ought, we also, you know, we teach that God wants you to have a long life. Psalm 91, 16, he satisfies us with long life. So, so God wants you fulfilling a purpose, running your race, living a long time on this earth. That's God's will for your life. But God hasn't promised we're going to live down here forever in this body, Right? And so, uh, death is a reality. But the good news, you don't have to be afraid of it. You don't have to be afraid of it. Praise God forevermore. We need to be thinking more like the Apostle Paul uh, in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, verse 21, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is what? 
gain? Gain? You know, that's, again, see, the world's idea, this, oh, death is some unspeakable heart. No. Uh, the Bible says death, physical death, passing from this realm into the heavenly realm is gain. Amen. You know, when you make a financial investment and you receive money back for that, you don't go, oh, <laughs> look at that. We yielded 20 more percent this year. Oh. And that's, see, it wasn't loss, it's gain. And so we have to have a different, we got to get a Bible perspective of things. Now, I realize when a loved one passes this life that we sense the loss. And there is a human grieving process, whether you're a Christian or, or not. I mean, you're, there is just a, there's someone you've been with a long time. I was just with a friend a good friend this past week, a pastor friend whose wife went home to be with the Lord. And he's in his 50s. He's, you know, he's, they were soulmates, just like me and my wife, you know, together in ministry, doing the work of God. And they were good friends of ours. And she went home to be with the Lord not too long ago. And I got a chance. This is my first chance to be with him. He lives on the West Coast. We got a chance to be together for a couple of days. And it was, it, you know, it was, it was good. And I, I, I wanted it. He, you know, we, we needed to be together a little bit. And and uh, uh, had a pastor's gathering, this, you know, for uh, several pastors, but he was one of them, and I got to be with him some. So it blessed me. But, uh, and, and so he was, he was still hurting. So we, I know that. I mean, there, there's, there's a sense of loss for a person that, that, that we have. But uh, he, st he could still, in the midst of that, laugh and rejoice. Amen. And that's, that's the way it is because we don't grieve like the world grieves. We should not be grieving because we need to be able to see things from an eternal, supernatural view, Bible-based view of death. Death is not, oh, it's so unspeakable, it's so horrible. No, it's really just a transition where you're gaining. Nobody on the other side in heaven, none of your loved ones or friends that are over, they wouldn't come back for any reason you tried to give them. They would not come back. They will not. They, they would, if they had a choice, no way would they come back because it's so much better. The Bible says it's gain. Now, that doesn't mean we need to be leaving early and wanting to leave early. We need to, again, fulfill our purpose here. God's got a plan for every individual in this room. Amen? But, you know, every time we, you know, the, Paul talked about grave, you know, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting in 1 Corinthians 15, you know? He pretty much mocked death, mocked the grave. <laughs> uh, you know, every time we stand by a grave, uh, it would be a good thing to just, to just be thinking this way. You know, grave, you don't have any victory here. You don't have any victory here. The body, uh, this body's gone. This body is now in the presence of God. So grave, you, you have won nothing. That's what Paul said. Grave, where's your victory? You can't whip a Christian. Even if they go on home a little early, even if they you know, died of some disease or, you know, and that, that ravaged their body or whatever, and they didn't get their healing or their victory, you still can't whip them in one sense. You understand what I'm saying? You can't. There's still, there's still victory for the believer because Paul says death is gain. God doesn't see, uh, you know, he sees the death of his children as, as, you know, as them coming to be with him. It's a transition, not a termination. <laughs> Amen. So that's why we can actually, even with a tear coming down our eye, you know, at certain points along the way, we can, we can still, man, we can shout. We can rejoice. And we sang about it. It makes me want to shout. Well, see, I can shout knowing I have loved ones already there, and they're, not, they're no longer suffering in this body. You know, we all, we all can think of those that, had, that maybe they suffered a lot. Well, they're not suffering now. They're a lot better off than you are. They don't even have the little aches and pains you have to deal with at times, you know, just by, just by being in this body, you know. But uh, praise the Lord. 
So but why? Because the grave, that's why, the, that's why Paul could mock the grave, because the grave isn't the end of the story. <laughs> it's not the end of the matter. Amen? So when the enemy tries to bring fear in this area of our lives, um, we, sh we should just resist it with the word of God and say, no, I'm, because uh, even if, even if I did worst case scenario, somebody, oh, a terrorist might get you. You could die in a, in a plane crash, die. You know, people talk about all the ways and they fear ways they could die or whatever. That's, you know, well, that, that's really foolishness. Because the worst case scenario, even if somebody stuck a gun to your head and blew it, and you know, we, again, we believe we teach protection and teach the power of the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. So I'm just, but I'm giving you a hypothetical worst case scenario, even if you, you know, didn't do what you were supposed to do. Worst case scenario for a Christian is a heavenly escort into the presence of God. Wow. That's why, the, that's why Paul could mock death. Mock the grave. Death, where's your victory? Grave, where's your, where's your victory and your sting? Amen? Hallelujah. So, uh, again, so, so we, we as believers should never fear death. So you need to take the word of God and just stand against it. Resist it in Jesus' name. Amen? A second, I don't have time to, we could do a whole, you know, teach you on each one of these, but I just, just had these couple in, our, in my heart. A second fear that we don't need to be yielding to in this life is the fear of people. The fear of people. In fact, too many Christians are, uh, you know, fear what others think. And what, you know, they, they fear rejection. They've, they fear not fitting in. They, you know, they, when, when all that really matters is what does God think first? What does God think first and foremost? And I found out that peer pressure doesn't stop just when you get to age 21. <laughs> and people are still impacted by what others think so much. It's really amazing what people will do. People normally, under normal circumstances, would not just pour toxins into their body and, and, and do things that would just hurt their body, cause them to live, you know, shorter lifespans and have dead brain cells and all these kinds of things. People wouldn't do that on their own. But then you throw in this thing called peer pressure and trying to fit in. And again, you know, you see young people, they, they may fall into some of these traps, but then, then again, I see older folks do it too. Want to be socially acceptable. You know, with their, whether it's relatives or employees or whoever. But, you know, some, you know, people have different kind of addictions. Some are addicted to alcohol. Some are addicted to whatever, you know. Uh, some, are, some are addicted to uh, man's attention. Some are addicted to pleasing people. Amen. Amen. They put pleasing people above God. You know, some people, they'll sit around a, 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 with a group of guys or whatever. I, I, I've seen this happen. And somebody will tell a dirty joke, and, this, and, and a Christian will sit there and laugh along with it. Just laugh and really not feeling good about it, really, you know, but just, just what, trying to fit in, trying to please somebody. Instead of, being, instead of saying, I'm not, you know, not, not to jump on anybody, not, not that you're supposed to be stand up and start preaching to them, but you don't have to jump in and, and uh, laugh along if, if, that's not, if you don't agree with that, if it, if it goes against your values, just to try to please people. Some people are addicted to pleasing people. Now, listen, every one of us wants to, wants to get along with people. That's just natural. You don't want to be trying to make, you shouldn't be wanting to try to make everybody mad around you or... Or, uh, you know, something's wrong with you then, yeah. But, but on the flip side of that, and it, you know, we should never be living our life to please people above God. Proverbs 29, 25, notice how the writer of Proverbs says it. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare. 
being so scared about what somebody else thinks brings a trap. It's a, it's a snare. It's a trap. It'll trap you. Amen. Really, it's a sign of spiritual weakness when, a, when some person's opinion of you is more important than pleasing God. It's a sign of spiritual weakness. See, I've told you, these type of fears, this is all a part of your spiritual growth. Certain fears you've got to, you've got to learn to resist and overcome, not be yielding to, if you're going to mature in God and do his will. Amen. But it's a snare. That means it'll keep you out of God's best blessings. Amen. You know, there are people that go to hell every day because they're more concerned about what a person thinks. You realize that? So we're not, I'm not just talking about Christians here. I mean, Christians deal with this, but there are people that are willing to go to hell because they, they want to be part of the gang, part of the group, because the devil's got them so deceived. But, they, but, they, but the devil uses things like pressure, social pressure, peer pressure, opinions of others, because there is a natural tendency in the human being to want to at least be get along and be pleased but but there's got there's got to come a point where the word of where the word of god if you're going to grow and mature the word of god's got to be number one in your life and pleasing him has got to be above any kind of pleasing of man because you you need to know if you'll please god you'll please the right people because you're not going to please everybody anyway and you don't want to if you're intelligent if you're trying to you're bound you're in a snare because that's the fear of man you're already trapped. You're already in bondage. Hallelujah. There are people that refuse blessings in their life. I, I, I've seen this. And, we're, and I know, the, you know how the enemy works in people with this. You know, people, will, people will not, uh, people have re resisted the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receiving, even though they had light on it. See, that's one thing. When you get light on something, you, sh you don't need to be shunning that and neglecting and putting that off. Once you get light, you need to act on it. And if you get light on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, don't be saying, well, you know, I don't know. Somebody, my relatives may not like that. My friends may not like that. Uh, So-and-so may not like that. Uh, you know, who cares? That needs to be our attitude. If God says, this is for you, and this is my will for you, we ought to be saying, yes, Lord, whatever your will is, and I'll let the chips fall after that. If somebody else don't like it, whoop dee dee. <laughs> and thing is, if you compromise things you know are true, eventually you'll lose the respect of the people you're trying to always please. If you keep compromising, 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 people may, you, you may think you're, they're, you're pleasing the gang, but in, all, uh, in reality, you're ult they're ultimately going to not respect you because you're a wishy-washy. You're wimpy. Amen. You're, you, you become a real wimp if all you want to do is please people. Life ought to be, for, I'm talking about for Christians. Christians need to be about pleasing God putting him first yeah loving people not trying to be honorary with people but lo loving people but not but, but when it comes to their opinion about your decisions and your choices especially based on the things of god that they their opinion doesn't mean a hill of beans compared to what god says amen i mean i, I I changed the whole course of my life when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It changed everything for me. It changed who I eventually was going to be hanging around with, who I eventually, I mean, because it separates. It separates you. Some of the, some of the denominational people, didn't, they didn't care much for my opinion anymore that I was around previously. And, then, and that's Okay. I love them, but I'm not going to change because I've already gotten, got an experience that's inside the realm of God's Word. And I've valued God's opinion above their opinion. I thank God I made that choice. Yeah, persecution sometimes comes with it. Any choice for God. If you're going to believe, if you're going to believe for your healing and somebody finds out about it, you realize that could open up the door to some persecution. 
But that's all right. I'd rather be healed. Then please them and stay sick. At least, you know, be, you know, these things are at least things we need to stand for. Look what God says in Isaiah 51 about this. Isaiah 51, verse 12. I just like this verse. God says, I, even I, am he that comforts you. Who art thou that shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? And of the son of man, which shall be made as grass. And you forget the Lord, your maker, who stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. So why are you scared of, a, of somebody that's going to die anyway? <laughs> Amen. We need to be more concerned about what God says about things, not what men say about things. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'll, I'll, I, this phrase kind of came up in my heart. If you fear man's opinion, you won't walk in heavenly dominion. Amen. Yeah, feel free to write that down if you want to. No, I mean, just sometimes things will pop up in you, you know. If you're going to fear man's opinion, you're not going to walk in heavenly dominion. And it's true. Amen. It's true. If you're fearing what men think, it'll limit you from walking in the, the will of God, the word of God, using your dominion. You know, one reason why I believe God wanted us filled with the Holy Ghost, like Acts chapter 1, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, and Jesus said so in Acts 1. He said, you'll receive dunamis. You're going to receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you. And then they were all filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts 2. Why? Because it empowered them to be a witness. It was heaven's influence in them and upon them that was necessary to thrust them out into a dark, lost, dying world to share Jesus. That's one reason why we need to stay filled with the Spirit. Not just have an experience that we, you know, 30 years ago where we, were, we spoke in tongues, you know, and we're filled. That's important that first step but you realize God wants us filled with the spirit and this was an empowering so that we could be bold when we need to be amen not to be abrasive I said to be bold there's a difference we just, we just need to be bold in who we are what we believe because we'll get timid if we're leaking out spiritually you understand Amen. Now listen, even if you've missed it, even if you've sinned, and you've had some struggles in your life or whatever, and people, you know, people may have their opinions about you. And they may have assessed that you are, you know, you're just not going to be much for God anymore. You just really can't do this or do that. For the kingdom of God. But even in that realm, you need to be able to see yourself as God sees you and value God's opinion above man's and realize I'm right with God. I've confessed my sin. I'm, he's faithful and just to forgive me. He's cleansed me. I'm right with God. And I am not going to lose my joy just because of somebody else's opinion of me right now. Because they're not looking at me like God looks at me. And this is important too. This is part of, some people live in depression because they are so fearful of what people think. And so concerned because somebody had a bad opinion about them. And they don't know the whole story. They don't see you by the blood. They don't see you the way God sees you. So you've got to see yourself the way God sees you. You've got to value God's opinion above man's in every realm, every arena. What does God have to say about this? Amen. You realize, though, that uh, we wouldn't have much of a Bible and, and testimonies from the Bible if those individuals in the Bible feared what men thought. Think about Daniel. <laughs> we wouldn't have the story of the lion's den and the victory and the great deliverance from the lion's den if Daniel had caved in to Nebuchadnezzar 
caved in to, you know, oh, we don't, you can't serve another God. You can't pray to your God. To your God. Well, Daniel said, big deal. I value God's opinion above yours. But notice Daniel got a great deliverance. God vindicated him. You realize God honors those that honor him. That's scriptural, right? He honors those that honor him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, same, same type of story. They, they, they wouldn't bow their knee when the trumpets and all the, the, the music was played, you know, wouldn't bow their knee to the statue. And they said, well, you're going to have to suffer the, you know, you're going to have to be a crispy critter, suffer the burning, fir burning fiery furnace. Well, see, they didn't change. They didn't say, well, wait a minute, we'll, we'll, we'll switch our allegiance here. No, they didn't value man's opinion. But guess what? They stood on the word of God and God delivered them. God honored them. And they're, for, they're eternally honored in the word of God. But see, we wouldn't have these stories. We wouldn't have the great apostle Paul. Paul we got death threats all the time. Paul got everywhere he went. They, they, he was warned, you're going to get beat up. You're going to get persecuted. He, he said, I don't care. I got to do what God told me to do. We wouldn't have the new, half the New Testament, you know. If Paul had been concerned about what men think. And that, that, this principle holds true for all of us. It's not, we're not going to fulfill God's will and plan if we're more concerned about what men think than what God thinks. The only way we know what God thinks is through his word. Amen. We wouldn't have the story of blind Bartimaeus. He wouldn't have got his great miracle, would he? Because they remember, he's, he called out for Jesus. Jesus, have mercy on me. And the disciples, Jesus' ministry team, the associate pastors, told Bart, shut up. <laughs> shut up, you're too late. Shut up. Don't bother Jesus. What did the Bible say he did? He got louder. He raised it up an octave. He said, man, I'm, whoa, wait a minute. He wasn't fearful of what they thought because he knew Jesus was a deliverer. That Jesus was a healer. If he could just get to him. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Of course, Jesus himself. <laughs> Jesus wasn't a guy just trying to get along. He certainly didn't care what the Pharisees had to say about things. He's, I mean, Jesus, he called them a bunch of white, you know, painted up tombstones. He called them vipers. Amen. He certainly wasn't a people pleaser from that standpoint, but he pleased the people that need to be pleased. He loved those who needed victory, healing, the power of God in their life, and he ministered to them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, there in a quickly look in, uh, look in John chapter 12. See, God wants to honor you. John 12, verse 26 Jesus said, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor. But look down now at verse, um, see, God wants to honor you, doesn't he? But he needs us to stay on his side and, and stand with him and esteem his word. Look at verse 42 and 43. He says, nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For, verse 43 says, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Wouldn't you like to have that stuck on your, beside your, your name throughout eternity? <laughs> wow. No, I wouldn't. And I wouldn't want it to be said of me. Oh, he loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Don't let it ever be said of you. Oh, he loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. You realize the Bible says you can get the praise of God. You can be honored of God. You can be, the Bible talks about how God exalts those who will humble themselves before him. In other words, if we, if we esteem God's word above the word of men and the, the praise of men, God will always honor that. Now, God honors what things, honors you in ways men don't or men can't, and men can't always see. But he also honors you in ways men can see. But he'll always, when God honors you, you want his honor. It pays to say, 
I'm going to do what God says. I could care less what, the man, what a man has to say when it, when it contradicts what God says. We all care about what people say, but we should never let it, when it comes to what does God say and what does man say, no brainer. I'm going with God. Number three, let me quickly mention this third area that we don't need to be yielding. Oh, my goodness. Don't, don't look at your watch yet. We'll just, maybe it'll just automatically start going back with a few moments. Uh, number three, we'll have to do this another time, I guess, mostly. The, the, the fear of life's adversity. Of course, of course, that covers a multitude of things. We could preach weeks on this one. The, the fear of life's adversity. Let's quickly, look, though, look at Mark chapter 5. We've got a man named... Jairus. See, when we're, faced, when we're faced with life's adversity, tests and trials, we've got a choice. We have a choice, fear or faith. <laughs> and we all get that choice at times in life, don't we? With different circumstances, we have opportunities to get into fear, and we have opportunities to trust God and be in faith. That's why the Word of God is so important in our life, because the Word of God and, and hearing the Word of God, meditating the Word of God, what does it do? It drives out fear. See, when faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing the Word of God. If faith comes by hearing the Word of God, that means fear goes by hearing the Word of God. Because faith and fear are opposite forces that work against each other. Amen? And one can replace the other. Praise God. So if we're having trouble with fear, what's a great thing to do? Hear the word. Get in the word. Meditate in the word. Because it will remove that faith, then will remove the fear in our lives. Mark chapter 5, we've got the story of Jairus, you know. Um, Jesus had uh, gone into his territory. Verse 22 says, And behold, there came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, besought him greatly, saying, My, my little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray you, uh, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Then we have, of course, the, uh, the account of here in between, you're stuck right in the middle of Jairus' experience, is a woman with the issue of blood, you know, where she got great victory, and then, of course, she got her healing. And then, right at verse 35, we pick it back up with Jairus, where it says, while, while he yet spake, this is Jesus talking to the woman, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house a cert certain person which said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the master any further? Wow. In other words, he got a pretty bad report. This is an adversity in life right here. Life's adversity struck. And it was the worst report he could get, right? But look at verse 36. Look at verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Oh, glory be to God. These words need to ring out in our lives regularly. <laughs> I, this is, this, these five words, I meditate on them occasionally. I just, you know, I just, be not afraid, only believe. Be not afraid, only believe. And, and when, when I'm dealing with something, when, I, when, I, when adversity comes, I, these are, this is one of those verses I meditate on. Just those, those five words from Jesus, from the lips of Jesus. Be not afraid, only believe. So he's letting me know if I won't fear and if I get into faith, something victorious is going to happen. The power of God is going to be able to be released. The situation is going to be able to be turned. But if I stay in fear, obviously there's a reason why Jesus said this. Fear opens the door to things you don't want. But faith opens the door to the power of God, which allows God to come on that scene and turn the impossibility into a possibility. And bring victory in the midst of defeat. Oh, glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So we need to be people who are standing on God's word. Putting the word of God first in our lives. Hallelujah. Because I know we live in a, in a world where fear is running rampant. But we need to be those who are so charged up with the Word of God and filled up with the life of God that um, when we are faced with life's adversity, our immediate 
response, the immediate response matters. That's why we need to stay full of the word. That's why we need to live and walk in the spirit. Walk in the word of God. Give the word place in our lives. Now, it doesn't mean you can't overcome a negative response, but it means you need to, we need to be so ready in life that, man, we're just ready with the word of God that no matter what comes, I'm not yielding to fear. I'm going to lean on the faith side. I'm going to stay on the faith side. I'm going to stay on the victory side because fear is an option, but fear doesn't give great results. Fear is an option for everybody. Now, if you, even if you yielded to fear, you can get out of fear. Thank God. But you may have to just plow in the word a little bit more. And you're going to have to stay with it. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to again, uh, our attention, what we attend to is going to make the difference. It's going to matter greatly. Because when fear, when fear comes, you've got to focus your attention on the word and not the problem. On the promise, not the adversity. You're going to have to do that by faith. You're going to have to say, no, I'm, I'm putting my attention. Jesus said, don't be afraid. He said, fear not. Only believe. Only believe. Be not afraid. Only believe. So I have a choice, right? You and I have a choice. It's not automatic. We have a choice. And that's why we need to be under the influence of the word so that our decision will be strongly influenced by the word. We still have a choice, though. We have a choice. But that's why we have to constantly, constantly keep our attention on what God says. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We should never tolerate fear. Never fear circumstances. Don't let life's adversity bring fear to your life. You may have feelings of fear come on you, but that doesn't mean you've yielded to it. We all get tempted with it. We all get feelings just jump on us. But that doesn't mean you've yielded to it. You've got to then act by faith on what you know, not what you feel. And that's how you're going to get in faith and stay in faith. You have to act on the word of God, not act on what you feel. Because wrong thoughts will come but, and fear will try to contaminate you. But we need to be like, uh, no, there's one more scripture here. Look in Hebrews chapter Hebrews chapter 13, notice, I just love this declaration, the last part of verse 5, and then verse 6, Hebrews 13, aren't you glad we've been given dominion over fear? See, if God's not giving you a spirit of fear, it means you've got dominion over it. Hebrews 13, verse, the last part of verse 5, Jesus said, he's quoting what Jesus said. For he, Jesus, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In other words, we've got the word of God. We've got what Jesus said. So, so then he starts in verse 6 and says, so that. In other words, because of verse 5 and the truth of the word of God in verse 5, Therefore, I can boldly declare something. See, when, you're, when you sense fear coming on you, you need to get in the Word and then start boldly declaring the Word. That's what he's doing right here. So he boldly, he declares, boldly, he says in verse 6, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do to me. Amen. See, I've got God's Word on it, so I can boldly declare I will not fear. Amen. See, anytime you get in God's word, you can get it in your heart, then you start boldly declaring and you say, I don't fear that. I don't fear lack because God said, my God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I don't fear dying in a plane crash because God said, Psalm 91, that he gives his angels charge over me and protect me every, everywhere I go. So you take the word of God, and then you stand against fear in your life. Amen? So you don't have to yield to this kind of fear. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody stand up. Praise God.